All right. Well, Virginia, are you ready? I think I'm as ready as I ever will be. Awesome. Okay, cool. So, um, well, um, my name is Andrew Seidler. I uh, direct UT's Office of Undergraduate Research and Fellowships. And, um, and as you have seen here, we will be recording this for future generations. So I'm going to try to have all my A material here, although luckily you won't have to hear from me too much today because I could say co-presenter, but like the main attraction is Dr. Virginia Stormer and I will let her introduce herself. All right. Thank you, Andrew. I'm hoping by the time this gets to future generation, sad parts will be back in. Um, as I've learned, they're no longer in. So I'm hoping when future generations see it, they'll be like, wow, she was really fashionable before her time. Um, so um, jokes aside for our, our Generation Z, um, I, my name is uh, Virginia Stormer and I'm the Assistant Director for Experiential Learning here at the University of Tennessee. Um, but specifically related to creating research posters, I wor have worked for the past probably four summers um, with the exception of last summer with the Chemistry REU here on campus. I work with those students who are coming from all over the country to work with the chemistry faculty here uh, to create posters on their research. Before I was in my current position, I also oversaw the 1794 Scholars Program who have a final capstone project where they create a poster. And, and so that's kind of where some of my um, expertise, I hesitate to use that term, but, but I'll use it um, for today that some of my expertise on poster creation comes. And so one of the first things that I, I wanted to mention, and, and Andrew, you can go to the, the next slide, is that today I'm kind of going to do a, a really quick highlights, high points, key points of creating a strong research poster, because I want to make sure we have time to hear for some real winners, some actual students, and listen to their experiences with creating research posters. But if there is if, you're, if you leave here and you wanna do more and you wanna learn more, um, the Office of Undergraduate Research and Fellowships has a spring research, research seminar series. And on March 24th, I'll be doing um, a full session on how to create an effective research poster. We're gonna go a little bit more in depth on that. I've also- and, Oh no, please, sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to move on to something else, Andrew. If you wanna... well, I, I was just going to say before you get you know too much momentum here, I I, I failed to um, introduce one of our uh, student presenters um, who's been a, an award-winning uh, uh, researcher and, and has had success presenting her research posters is uh, Catherine Copeland. And Catherine, if you want to say hello really quickly. Hi, everyone. That was very quickly, Catherine. Well done. Um, so, uh, and and we'll we'll Catherine will we'll talk a little bit more later on about her experience and sort of from a uh, you know figuring out the process and and things that I, I think have worked and not. And, and we'll talk with, with her a little bit later. And we'll have another student who'll be joining us just a, in a little while. She's at a, a virtual graduate school um, a open day, but Samantha Manis um, will join us as well. So get to hear, uh, hear from some students. So, but appreciate all of you being here. And if there are things that come up along the way, you know, feel free to use, use the chat and we'll be sharing resources along the way. So, um, but glad you're here. And uh, this will be the highlight of the next hour of your life and maybe even the best thing you do all week. So here we go. All right. Well, those were high expectations. Um, thank you, Andrew. And yes, I was, I was just jumping in, getting off running. So um, I'm glad we got to introduce everybody. And, and again, I, I think that the highlight will be hearing from, from other students, but I will, will share with you what knowledge I have. And so the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to drop into the chat a link to a Google document that that um, you're, you're welcome to, to open and, and kind of follow al along with that really lays out some of the basic principles of creating a strong research poster. And, and again, this is something that I will talk about a little bit more in depth um, at the, the one hour or the 45 minute session in, in March. But one of the first things I always like to start with, because I've had students who've come to me, um, great students doing amazing research, and they say, my 
mentor said, I need to create a poster. I don't even know what that is or how you would do that. Um, what does that even mean? And so I always like to start with how do I even do this? How do I get started with that? And for most students, the easiest place to go is to PowerPoint. Um, for some students, if you have more advanced skills, uh, Adobe Illustrator, um, InDesign, some of those software also have the capability for creating posters. And I know for certain disciplines, that tends to be, be more popular than PowerPoint, just because PowerPoint, it's nice for most students because it's relatively simple and it's a software that most students are familiar with, but it is fairly limited in terms of its design capabilities. But essentially what most students do when they set up their um, posters, they go into PowerPoint and create it on a single slide. The other thing that you'll see on the handout that I've dropped in are um, UTK templates. One of the nice things about the University of Tennessee, and these are on the Office of Undergraduate Research and Fellowships Eureka website, is that they've created some templates that have already set up posters um, with um, a nice color scheme, um, two, three or four columns, all things that we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and that can be easy if that's your first time. The other thing that I al also always recommend is if you are presenting a poster external to UT and you're doing it as a representative from UT, it's good to use the UT branded um, so template. So you'll see the links to those templates in the um, getting started section of the handout. So the next thing that I'll say is when you're when you're approaching, once you've got your PowerPoint going, the next thing that you want to think about is that when you're creating a research poster, it's not just about the research. Um, unlike, say, a paper or even sometimes just an oral presentation, when you're creating a poster, the presentation of the research is almost as important as the research itself, because if it's not presented in a visually appealing way, people aren't going to stop and look at the poster or engage. And so you want to think about, for example, using color schemes that are um, not jarring to the eye. I know the 80s are making a comeback, but neon does not have a place on research posters. Um, you also want to make sure that you're not cramming too much on your poster, um, giving a little space for it. Another term I also always like to use with students is the idea of reader gravity. This is not something we think about a lot, but when you are taught to read as a child, you are taught to start at the top of the page, read from left to right, and continue down. If you have columns that go, if you have information that's going all the way across, um, people are going to get confused about the order. So you want to make sure that the way that you present your poster is visually appealing and makes sense. So this is a poster um, that I, I like to give as an example that maybe is not presenting its information in a way that is visually appealing. So you'll notice a couple of things. One, um, the, the text boxes are not lined up. So it's not clear, where do I start reading? When I look at this, I'm not entirely sure. Um, another thing about this is that you've got white writing on a light colored background. In general, white writing, unless it's for the big title, is, is generally recommended against because again, if you think back to your time growing up, learning how to read most of your textbooks, things that you read now, um, most of them are in black ink or, or, or dark navy or, or something of that. And so our eyes are, are more attuned to that. Um, if you have something in really, really big font, like your main title, and it's white on a darker background, that's fine. But uh, it, it this is a poster that my sort of very organized type A heart looks at and feels very overwhelmed about. And so even if the research here is excellent, I might not stop at this poster um, because I can't quite figure out what's going on. All right. And so I've, I've included a, a graphic to help you <laughs> remember this presentation of the, the human digestive system. Um, so one of the other things you'll want to think about is how do you make your poster easy to digest? And what I mean by that is 
people should be able to find things quickly, um, find information quickly, particularly your key takeaways. So one of the things you'll want to make sure of is that you keep your text to no more than 900 words. Um, and if you think about that in terms of a paper, most college students write 300 to 350 words a page. So that's really, you know, two and a half to three pages pages worth of information, which is not a lot. If you think about it and compare it to say an article for a peer reviewed journal that's going to be closer to 20 or 30 pages um, long, um, this is pretty short. And so you have to be really careful about the information that you use. And so you can use things like bullet points and um, bolding or highlighting headings to make sure that you are um, calling people's attention to to what they should be seeing. And as part of that too, you wanna to think about making sure that you include Im images. Um, images, one of my least favorite sayings is a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, however, <laughs> with posters, images can replace a lot of text. I won't quantify exactly how much, um, but they also allow your audience to see a visual representation of um, of your research. So you might be able to show more information through an image or a picture. And again, it makes your, your poster more visually appealing. Um, and so I'll give, I always, I always think it's easier to see what not to do than what to do, because then you know kind of what to avoid. Um, and so I want to have you all look at another poster on our next slide, um, where you can see it. I look at this and I have a hard time figuring out, you know, what's really important here. Uh, what are some of the main takeaways? What am I supposed to be focused on? There's a lot of text. Um, to me, this looks like a paper that was sort of just put onto a poster. Um, and there are no sort of key indicators for my eye that say, you know, here are five pieces of information that are really important. Um, this section is the most important section. Um, this image is particularly important. Um, it feels very overwhelming. And, and again, always going back to that idea that um, how you present your information is just as important as what the information is itself. And so my, my final piece of advice about posters too is that your poster should tell a complete story by itself. A lot of the time you'll be standing next to your poster and you'll be able to give your presentations. You can give a really robust understanding of your, uh, of, of your poster, which is nice because again, you're limited to those kind of not about 900 words. But at the end of the day, there are gonna be times when maybe you're not gonna be standing next to your poster. There also might be attendees who prefer to walk around and just look at posters and they don't really necessarily want to, to interact with the attendees. And so when you're looking at your poster and you're thinking, okay, is this a strong poster? What you wanna think about is if someone comes up to this poster and looks at it, um, number one, one, are, are they going to want to stop because it's visually appealing enough? But number two, if they just have the poster, can they have a complete picture, a complete understanding of what I've been doing for my research and walk away feeling like, oh, okay, I get it. I, you know, I understand what that was about. I understand why that was important. Um, and that's one of the things I, I thought was interesting when I first started working with students on posters. I know some of them wouldn't put their names on it. And I would always have to remind them, make sure your name's on the poster. Um, because again, you, you never know um, when you're not with your poster, someone could walk by someone from a graduate school, a potential employer, um, a future professor who wants to work with undergraduates. Um, and so you want to make sure they know who you are and you want to make sure that they have a good idea of what your research research is and what your research looks like. And so I'll also show you a couple of examples of posters that I think did hit the mark here. Um, and I, one of the things I wanted to do is also show posters from a couple of different disciplines, because I think um, depending on what your discipline looks like, your poster is going to look a little different. And one of the things I also always say that as a caveat to all of the advice I give is uh, sometimes I'll have students come to me and say, well, you said we should do it this way. My advisor says we should do it another way. And I say, ignore everything I said, do what your advisor tells you to do. Um, because 
each discipline has a slightly different way of doing things. They might have a different way of presenting information. Um, and especially if they're the ones that are giving you the grade, you do what they tell you to do. Um, but you also uh, want to make sure because they'll have experience um, at presentations in their industry. And so they'll know what people are looking for. And so uh, the sort of the, the takeaway from that too is always get advice from your mentor. Um, don't create a poster on your own based on what I'm telling you, what's in that handout, um, and then you know get it ready to go for Eureka. Instead, uh, make sure that you have um, someone with disciplinary expertise look over your poster as well. And so um, this poster is from a, a, a social science natural kind of crosses both social science and natural sciences poster focusing on um, treating students with autism. And so a couple of things you can see here is that um, first the color scheme is, is pretty neutral. Um, I will admit I don't love the multicolor graphs in the middle. That's not my, my, my favorite, um, but I'm immediately drawn to those graphs and I can tell partially because that middle column is slightly larger that that's what's really important. Um, so depending on your research for some students your results are really important. For other students your conclusions are really important. For some students um, you may not even have gotten to the implementation of your study yet. And so your posters really only goes up to kind of the methodology and the theory behind it. And that's okay too. Um, but in looking at this, I know immediately that the important thing is this case study um, that's highlighted in the middle of the page here. And then you can also see in the um, second box on the far left hand column that this person has created a kind of a flow chart to again um, help you visually understand some of the key points. There's limited text. There are a few full sentences under um, that define, for example, what autism is and giving some of the background information. But then again, you also have some moments where the bullet point points are listed. So again, if I'm walking around and I think, oh, this, this poster is pretty visually appealing. I think it's kind of interesting. I might quickly scan those bullet points and that's going to help me decide, okay, now I want to go back and actually read the whole thing, or I want to ask this person some questions. I want to hear that presentation because I've been able to very quickly digest some of the information that's on um, this poster. So again, not perfect. I also think the I'm really a white space person. Um, I really like nice gutters as they call them. So the um, columns here you'll see are a little, we'll squeeze a little tight for, for my personal liking. Um, so this isn't a, a, a perfect poster, but I think in terms of um, color scheme, it's nice. And in the way that they highlight what's important um, and present the, the text or the information is, is done well. So this next poster comes from a, a business a, a supply chain department. And I really like this poster, but sometimes when I use this in, in workshops, uh, some of my STEM students say, this is too many images. You know, there's not enough data. Where's the data? Um, and what, we, what I like to think about is that in business, it's a little bit different. You have to, you know, catch people's attention. You're moving quickly. You've got to make a splash. And that's what those images in the middle of the page do. They're supposed to make a very, very strong point. That picture in the bottom center, um, you can't not look at that, right? Um, and it, it really highlights what um, some of the problems with conflict minerals are um, and, and gets people thinking about the human cost of those. And, and so I think for a biz, from a business standpoint, um, they've done a nice job with, the, with using those images to draw you in quickly and make a, a, make a point and make it fast. Again, I will say that the bullet points on that right hand column are squished a little close. So again, not perfect. Um, I also might think about boxing out some of these, um, some of the areas like the abstract, the research objective, that kind of thing um, to make it a little more clear. But the, again, the other thing that you can see is they've used all bullet points. So you can, again, quickly move through the um, poster. It's very clear what each section is about. Um, that's another important thing. For STEM, this tends to be fairly easy, right? Introduction, methods, results, conclusion, discussion, um, what have you. Um, for the, the social science 
businesses and the humanities, those titles might be a little less obvious, but you nonetheless want to make sure that whatever your subheadings are, they are quick and clear um, and follow um, an, an obvious trajectory. And so I, I like to show those two again, because I, I, I think that um, posters in the uh, natural sciences are more common, um, but posters in other disciplines um, are becoming more and more common thanks to things like Eureka, that is an interdisciplinary conference for all students engaged in all kinds of undergraduate research. And it's a great way for us all to show off the way our disciplines work differently. And the nice thing about the poster is it is very adaptable. You can use it to show off what it is that your discipline does in terms of research and what you've done in terms of your research. So I um, would be happy to, to take any questions or um, comments from, from our crowd. Yeah, so, well, thank you, Virginia. And, and um, before we kind of move over to, you know, talking with our students here, I was kind of curious if you all would in, indulge me, whether um, in the chat or just, you know, uh, saying something or turn on your video, but let us know. Oh, I recognize a couple names, but, but, you know, majors and maybe a little bit about your, your experience with research and presenting research. Anyone want to say anything in any of the uh, provided formats? I can go ahead and speak. Um, yeah. I, I've already met with Andrew, so he probably hopefully recognizes my name a bit. Um, <laughs> my, I guess my major is ecology and evolutionary biology, but I'm actually currently doing research in the biosystems engineering soil science um, discipline kind of, that's where my mentor is. And I've been working through the Center of Environmental Biotechnology. And this is kind of like my first research experience. Um, and so I'm planning on presenting my findings at Eureka. And it's kind of, it's a mixed STEM and mixed social science project. It's about uh, the perceptions that Tennessee farmers have in regards to um, biosolids and organic fertilizers. Um, so I've gotten that survey approved by IRB and out. And so I'm excited to make my first poster, but that's a little bit about me. Well, thank you, Olivia, for getting things going here. And, um, and I'm glad you will be um, presenting, planning to, to present at Eureka and I'll uh, at the end of the presentation, I'll put in a plug for a few different things and, and note some deadlines and other opportunities to present and fund research and all that good stuff. I'm seeing some other good things in the chat here. We have a biomedical engineering student who's an undergraduate research assistant for um, about two years and working on a poster for, for Eureka as part of a group project. And we definitely see a lot of those, which I think um, some people love that and some people group research projects brings out a whole other dimension of their personality, but um, awesome. I'm seeing another senior in nursing um, doing a sort of senior design project um, and will be throughout junior and senior year presenting at Eureka Hall, nutrition major. Um, aha, first, okay, nutrition major in nutrition 450 lab with, um, and so is this a, is this a, um, uh, I don't know if this is a, uh, an, a, a senior course or if this is something that uh, you just sort of hopped into? Oh, it's a, um, it's a special topics course. Cool. Excellent. Um, well, uh, there are, I, I think that the, you, you know, um, uh, uh, Virginia, one of the very first, uh, one of the very first slides was, you know, where, where do I start? And I think, right, it's sort of, you know, starting with the project. And then I think that often the question of when should I present it? I think that, that especially posters, they are really like tailor-made to something that you are working on. 
you know, it doesn't have to be, I'm totally done. I figured everything out. I mean, it's meant to sort of elicit responses and feedback because it's something that you're still sort of thinking about. So I don't think there's, a, you know, I think sometimes students worry, oh, I'm not ready for, I, I think uh, more students are, are generally more ready for that um, than, than sometimes they, they might think. So um, any, uh, before, uh, before we kind of start talking with, with Catherine, I think our other students should be here shortly. Um, are there are there questions based on um, what Dr. Sormer presented, or um, or just general how tos that that you want to make sure we we addressed here? All right. Well, if something comes up, please do let us know. Um, so. Uh, so Catherine Copeland, Catherine, you graduate in December, right? Yes. And, and so, yeah, so Catherine was, um, um, won um, a couple of awards at Eureka for her research in, in linguistics. And is also um, a current semifinalist for um, a Fulbright research and teaching project in Austria. So we have our fingers crossed there. And um, is, I mean, as a super soon, a smart person, someone who I think, though, who has also, you know, gone through this process very recently and sort of, you know, getting used to, oh, how, how do I kind of uh, make the things that I've been sitting there thinking about and working on a lot? How do I make them interesting and, and appealing to others? So, um, so, I mean, just very briefly, Catherine, you could tell everyone, you know, like what you majored in. And how and like how, how did you get going in research and maybe tell us a little bit um, a little bit about it? Um, so I was an English major um, and I minored in linguistics. Um, and so in my sociolinguistics course in fall 2019 um, with Dr. Greaser, every time she teaches that course, um, all the students do their own independent sociolinguistic research. And um, so for that class, actually, we um, we had like a little mini colloquium type thing um, at the end of the course. So we all kind of made little makeshift posters with like PowerPoint slides, like nine printed out and then put together on like taped up on the wall. Um, so that was kind of the first time that I got to experience presenting research. And then I took the same research that I did in that class um, and presented at Eureka the next year um, in a more actual poster format, although it was virtual. Um, and then I also presented it at um, Cornell's undergraduate linguistics colloquium um, last spring as well, also virtual. Um, so yeah, it was definitely, it's definitely different presenting it virtually versus in person, even though I only had that one kind of not real, um, not like a real conference pre uh, presentation experience the first time because it was just with my class, but um, definitely a lot of things are different and um, yeah, I guess that's, is there anything else or? Well, there's gonna be a bunch more, but <laughs> that is a perfect introduction. So thank you, Catherine. And just in time, like perfect timing, Samantha. So um, so this is our other student presenter who, all right, you can take one breath, Samantha, like, okay, ready. So this is uh, Samantha Manis, who is a senior um, in material science and engineering who is also a, a, a Fulbright semifinalist to do a research project next year in Luxembourg and was um, a recipient of the Goldwater Scholarship last year, which is uh, uh, pretty much the most prestigious um, undergraduate scholarship for students um, pursuing STEM research careers. So Samantha has a lot of research experience and um, just to maybe start, just just really, you know, tell us basics, you know, major and how you kind of got started in research a little bit, um, and, you know, uh, and then we'll I'll ask you a few things about just, you know, your particular, um, you know, ideas about how you uh, how you like to present your research, what you've learned, what what's worked, what hasn't. Sorry, uh, but uh, 
yeah, I'm a senior in material science and engineering. Um, so I'm in actually the smallest engineering discipline. So uh, those of you who might not be in engineering might even might not even know we have that major, um, but we do. And I think that's part of what helps me get into research as early as I did, um, because pretty much when, when I came in my first semester freshman year, I was like, I probably should get a job. <laughs> and uh, of course, if you're in STEM, the, the big thing for you to do is to get into research because you are paid as an undergraduate researcher. And so uh, I just went and talked to both my department head and a couple of the professors I knew. And because my department is really small, they were able to be like, oh yeah, we know there's a there's a guy who is a material scientist, but he's technically in the mechanical department and he's looking for uh, a new student. And so that was in Dr. Compton's lab and I've now been working for him since, uh, since late 2017. So um, I know that's that, that might not be like super relatable, but I, it's, in general, similar to things I hear from people in larger majors, which is just, you have to be, you have to be kind of tenacious in a way, and you have to, um, you have to really keep, like, if, if you ask about getting a research position and you don't hear something back, you, uh, like, just keep trying, because uh, people who are doing research at this university want to hire students. Um, they really, they wanna get you involved because it's beneficial to them uh, for you to be able to gain some expertise and help them in what you do. Um, so if this is something you're interested in and Andrew, I know your office just hired that uh, new position this summer. Um, what, was the, what was the title of that? We hired a position, wait, what did I do now? Or maybe that was last semester. Well, we will talk at the end here about um, a lot of upcoming sorts of, you know, like deadlines and opportunities to both present and get research funded. Yeah. So, but anyway, um, so I will um, definitely hit on that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the ONSF office also has has support for for uh, if you want to get into research through things like fellowships or grants. Um, that's also uh, an option. Um, so yeah, just uh, it's kind of like a through the grapevine thing when you're an undergraduate because it's not as formal a process as grad students and you just sort of have to ask around. Um, and if you have access to people like department heads or something like that, they're great to ask because of course they know everyone in our little isolated part of the field at UT. And so they will be able to tell you, oh, I, I heard that this person has an opening or things like that. So, so thank you. Um, thank you, Samantha and Catherine for sort of yeah, intro and where how you kind of plugged into into research. So, so what, um, you know, the, the, I guess, you know, Catherine, if you want to go first, you know, the first time you were going to, uh, yeah, develop a research poster, and that was for Eureka, or is that for this uh, uh, colloquium at, at Cornell? Um, so I actually initially developed the poster for the class um, and then just like modified it for Eureka and, and the Cornell Colloquium. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So, so how did you decide to like, where, where I don't know, where did you start um, in terms of yeah, developing it? Um, it was actually, I guess I have to give all the credit to my professor, Dr. Greaser, because she kind of gave us all like a very um, for linguistics specifically, like kind of a format to follow. And also because she didn't want us to spend the like resources on actually printing up like a real poster. Um, so she basically just said, you know, make nine PowerPoint slides with, you know, the kind of standard seven to nine different categories in like a linguistics paper. So abstract, um, background, um, you know, methodology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that was kind of the format I followed and I modified it a little bit um, eventually going to, into Eureka because I didn't have as much, um, because I pretty much had like only two like graphs for my results. I kind of, and also because my abstract was a little wordy and I kind of struggled to like get down to like the bullet points and like get words off of my poster, I guess. 
I kind of um, added a little section with like my research question just to kind of focus it. And like um, a lot of people um, at the Cornell Colloquium, I, I didn't get like a ton of like direct feedback on my poster from Eureka, but when I went to um, the Cornell uh, Linguistics Colloquium, a lot of people liked that. Um, so, but, but once again, that was pretty much um, my professor, Dr. Grieser, kind of encouraged us to do that. So, um, so yeah, but I, th I thought it was really helpful to like block it off like that, just because um, instead of just trying to like mesh things together, just, you know, keep the general um, structure, which is what you guys were talking about earlier, so. And 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 Virginia's like golden rule of listen to your professor, you know. So that's always a good. So so and, and yeah, Samantha, you know, I don't know. Like, could you tell us a little bit about some of the you know context where you presented posters and 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 what you think uh, maybe worked and didn't? Yeah. Um, so I'll say if uh, I know definitely in engineering, and I think also in other uh, like science-based majors there there's usually sort of uh your your first experience with the poster is sort of like a, a softball like mini poster session for a project you do in class um in engineering and the engineering fundamentals program um i know i did i think maybe two of these um where you do some sort of little self-contained project with partners and then you put together a poster based on it and uh, it's it's definitely way more simplified than the uh, posters i've put together for research but it definitely is really good uh, for getting your toes wet. Um, and even if you've ne never made a poster before you actually go to present your research, um, I, yeah, definitely your advisor, your professors are, are great resources. Um, if you are in a research group uh, or in some sort of other setting where you have access to grad students, this is what they do all the time. So they also have great insight into that. Um, and I guess sort of my approach to making a poster is just the idea not of not losing the forest for the trees, because it's very easy, at, especially in a STEM research poster, to get super, super, super granular way too fast. Um, and to have instead of like big sections on like, uh, like background and motivation, experimentation and results and performance, you go like very like you want to be able to sort of have a flow to the way people read your poster and if you if you try to break things up into too much detail even if that detail is like it, it's correct and it, it might be interesting but the thing is when you present a poster you usually only have maybe five to six minutes with each person that comes by so it, even if you put all that detail in it it sort of it almost like detracts from your ability to sort of streamline and give almost like an elevator pitch of your your research um because of course when you when you get to a position where you can actually have like 25 minute presentation talks that kind of detail is fantastic but when you're doing a poster you really want to it's it's like a highlight reel of your research really um just the the most important points that tell the story of the project that you have worked on so this is where this is why this project was interesting, or this is the problem that it is trying to address. Here's a little bit of relevant background information just so you have the context for what I'm doing. Uh, the broad sort of process of experimentation um, to analyze things related to that question. And then uh, generally, what are we, what did we find and why does it matter? And I have one follow-up, but I also like Virginia. Please, you know, like hop in here, or you know. So, um, but I'll just I'll keep going. But but I did. I guess one one thing I'm I'm worried about is how how um, you know based on uh, maybe some of the experience you had, how you think about balancing what you're going to put on paper, but also or on the poster, but also and those things that you think I do want to talk about this. I do want to be asked, and how um, how the two of you may be. Um, yeah, that, that fine balance between sort of anticipating what someone might ask you about, uh, uh, but not having, you know, what is it, 900 plus words on, on your, your, your poster. So how did you think about that in, in, in either order you two can take that? Um, I guess for me, the, the way that I put my posters together, especially the first couple, um, I honestly, I, I would, 
my professor recommended I do this and it's actually really helpful. I got a big sheet of paper and I started blocking it off in those broad sections, background, experimentation, conclusions. And then in each of those, maybe I would have like three broad points and I would have some little bullet points and maybe, okay, I'm gonna have this figure here and this figure here, and this is the general flow. And so when doing that, I would, I would of course think of things that I'm like, ooh, that, that would be good to include or something like that. But of course, like not everything's gonna make the cut. So I would actually take like sticky note tabs and be like, oh, okay, here's something that's relevant and things like that, um, just to sort of make sure I got all my ideas out on paper, even those that weren't gonna make the posters. So that's, at least for me, that's like a practical way that's been really useful of making sure that my poster has the, the brevity that it needs while also reminding myself of things that are relevant to mention in your talk, because of course your talk is never just reading your poster. You, you have to give a little flavor, a little more sort of information that helps flow the sections together. And of course, people will ask you questions and you need to be prepared to answer those uh, suitably. So sitting down and just like, just dumping all of your ideas and information out onto paper, at least for me, because I am a very like visual person, um, is, is a great way to organize or to start to figure out, okay, this is, this is an idea that needs to be on the poster. This is an idea that it's not on the poster, but that I might mention. And then this is something I don't need to touch on. Thank you. And, and yeah, and Catherine, you're, you're kind of take on that. Yeah, I agree with um, most of what Samantha said. And also um, something that I struggled with was because it was like my project with social sciences, it was really heavy on background and like conclusion and like limitations because you know, words and everything's very complicated and nuanced. So I have to like get into that. Um, so what I found to be really helpful, and this is something that my professor, Dr. Greaser, especially recommended for, um, like if you're going to, like when I went to the Cornell Linguistics Colloquium, like a lot of the people who were there um, would know like what certain theories or like things meant that I might not have to explain necessarily what that is like I would in the paper. So I can just kind of drop that. And if someone wants to ask about it, like I can, it's there. So like they can ask about it and I know it. Um, so that was something that was really helpful for me because a lot of my research paper was kind of like explaining and like demonstrating knowledge of particular theories. Whereas on the poster, I can just kind of have it there. Um, so yeah, and, and similarly, like just kind of for those bigger sections where I have like all these different things that I'm going into just kind of blocking them off and like bullet pointing them and like bolding kind of the main idea so that like I can stay on topic and make sure everything's on there and then you know get more detailed when talking to people if I need to. To our gold mine. Um, the, no this, this is all all really um, really good and, and you know and insightful and some things that I haven't even you know in a while thought about it it's really um, or hadn't thought of in that way so are, are, are there are there questions that that anyone wants to ask of well anyone for that matter uh, I'll throw in one more, um, but uh, Virginia, you look like maybe you were about, feel like you had something there, so. Sure, I'd, I'll ask a question. I, I'd be curious to know if there's anything that you only learned after going through the process of presenting your poster and um, hearing feedback um, that you didn't think about before um, that, that now maybe has changed the way you approach your poster. Uh, that, that might be some kind of nice advice for, for our attendees who uh, some of whom may be new that, that again, you just, you didn't know it until you got in that presentation and you thought, okay, next time I do this, I'm gonna change this particular thing. Um, I think definitely um, just like I thought that I trimmed my word count like down a lot and it still wasn't but it was like I guess just like getting an outsider perspective is really helpful even if they don't like know necessarily what you're talking about just to like look at it and see how it looks 
And something else I didn't think about too is um, making posters colorblind accessible. Um, there are websites where you can like check and like put an image in. Um, so I didn't do that for my poster because I it was brought to my attention after I had already presented them, but um, that was just something I had never thought about. Um, and similarly, because I presented both in person and also virtually, um, it's like, I don't know, I guess I wish I had known that I was going to be presenting virtually when I made the poster because it, it definitely would have made some things easier because I wouldn't have had to focus on readability as much because I was able to like zoom in to certain things when I was presenting virtually. So it would have made it a lot simpler to like, I guess, think about that, but yeah. Catherine, I think you bring one of the things that I think is really interesting um, as much like everything else in this world, COVID's changed a lot. And I don't think we will go back. Um, you know, I think, yes, we, will we go back to in-person presentations? Yes. But will there still be a lot of conferences that do poster presentations? Yes. And so I think it'll be interesting to see three or four years from now. I think I'm going to have to update some of my information um, because you're right. Um, some uh, everything's virtual right now. And that's likely to some of that is likely to continue. Yeah, I'll definitely jump off of that. Um, being able to present virtually is, I mean, in a lot of ways it sucks because you're, you're out there, you're not having that face-to-face -face interaction with the person you're talking to, but it does let you cram a lot more figures in that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Because I think the biggest lesson I learned when I first presented is, oh my God, I need to make things bigger than I thought because you may think that like a three foot by two foot poster is huge and it is, but when you get down to those granular little Excel plots with like 200 data points and each one of them is labeled, you really got to blow those figures up. Um, and that's that's part of the, that, that, that goes in hand with the idea of cutting down word count. Um, I think the best thing I did in my poster development was to go to a grad student who was in my research group, but not attached to my research project and said, just go to town on this, just cut stuff out because he wasn't attached to the work like I was where I would feel bad about like cutting things out because my project is my baby, but he wasn't attached to it. So he was able to just go through essentially in PowerPoint with the virtual version of a red pen and just cross stuff out, just um, cut down inefficient words, cut out information that wasn't um, like the, the very relevant to his understanding of what was going on, uh, telling me this figure should go there, things like that. Um, so I think definitely, like Catherine said, having someone with an outside perspective and maybe who isn't so involved in the, pro the project is really handy because that's who you're going to be talking to. You're not presenting to people who are experts on what you're doing. You're, you're not, they, they weren't in the lab with you. Um, and so making sure that not only that your poster is uh, informative and things like that, but that it is actually, it's interesting to read and makes sense to read. And instead of being like this really dragging on thesis of your work, it's really just, like I said, like a highlight reel. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, well, I, I really appreciate all, all, all the sort of like different points you're bringing up and, and a couple of them that are coming to mind as you're, you're talking about that, the, the two of you is, is sort of the way the experience of putting together a research poster um, un, unto itself, I think is a really important one because among other things, it, it takes something that you haven't maybe been, you know, thinking about in a visual sense and putting, I think it sort of reveals certain things that are going on in the project, the data, or how people react to it. And I think it can improve the research itself sometimes going back, you know, it being part of that process. And I think the more people you involve always with research and now uh, your field, it's a good thing. And I think these sorts of presentation has a way of doing that, that, that sometimes other parts of research don't. So I think that's such a, a really good, healthy thing. And then the other part is that, you know, these are two Yes, these are two very impressive, talented, you know, students that, that are that we're talking with. They're, you know, they're also folks who up until, you know, relatively recently had not done or presented research. I mean, relatively recently, and then presented something and it may have been, you know, on campus or in a department or a class, and then it became presenting at um, at national conferences and then starting to, you know, use that to work on fellowships applications to go and spend a fully funded year 
um, abroad. So I, I think, you know, th this seems sort of like, oh, we're really belaboring the research poster, but I think it is, uh, I mean, like 99 times out of 100, it is where the, the, the students like first real experience of taking research they've done and then sharing it with, with people is. And so that's why I think it's important not to say, so the lesson here is make a perfect research poster and when you're able to do that, then you're, you know, if you can make a, per a perfect research poster, then you can present like, no, not at all. I mean, I, I think it's just sort of part of this process. So I, I, I really like, yeah, a lot of the different sorts of um, topics that, that you're bringing up here, both of you. And um, I wanted to, before we ran out of time, you know, just see if there were other questions. I also want to just show you a couple of things and, and also just make sure if anyone has a, other, a last something they want to ask. Andrew, can I just tack on another comment? Please, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. So just in what you were saying, the, the other thing that I think is so important about poster making yeah. is it is such an important transferable skill. So even if you are not going to spend your life being a researcher and be a professor at the university and travel around to conferences until you're 80 years old presenting your research, um, doing this kind of work, this kind of high level thinking, this sort of distillation of information, um, presenting it in again, a, a digestible manner, any profession that you go into, um, you're gonna be able to talk about the ways in which those skills you use to put together um, a poster are going to transfer really well into the job place when you're giving presentations for clients. Um, when your boss says, hey, we need to make a decision about something. Here's a bunch of research on it. Figure out what we should do, right? Um, so I, I think that the other thing to think about with, with posters is not just their benefit for you to understand your research and kind of have those aha moments. Like this is what's really important. So I am going to put this on the poster, um, but it's also important to think about the ways in which you're, you're building skills that will be useful to you outside of the research arena. That's one of my pet things, so I just had to throw that in there. Yeah, I'll agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, I, I think I, I sort of learned about my project, like all of the things that I've done posters for, I definitely, my, my understanding of them was deepened by the fact that I had to put together this poster that, that had this streamlined version and I had to identify, I had to go and think, okay, what are the core elements of this? I know that maybe I have this nebulous idea of what the goal is, but like, what are the concrete steps I've taken to achieve that? What are the concrete results I've produced? What are patterns in those things that I might not have realized beforehand? Uh, it's also fantastic at highlighting gaps in your work. Um, so I, I'll definitely agree with what uh, Virginia said. It, I, I think it is just as valuable, if not more valuable than in, in my case, going in the lab and doing research because no matter what you do, if you be a, if you're a researcher or you work in industry or something like that, I know I'm using engineering terminology, but um, you're always going to have to explain your ideas to somebody else because no matter what field you're in, you're going to be sort of an expert in whatever you do, um, just by nature of you're going to work on something and you're inevitably going to have to present it to someone who is outside of that 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 project or that vein of work or something like that and so I that I think is probably the most transferable skill it's just like interpersonal communication with the flavor of technical edification well um I will not follow that up so eloquently or even passionately but I do want to make sure that I share um we all see in this uh, upcoming, yeah. So here's just a, a couple of upcoming events and deadlines. And uh, at the very bottom, that just a uh, um, reminder that that's, uh, that was that one that um, Dr. Sormer will be doing a sort of more, I guess, like technical deep dive, like step-by-step -step in terms of how to um, approach your uh, research posters. And even if you have, feel that you've gotten what you need, tell your friends. Um, but going back to the top here, summer research internship applications, do we extend that to next week? So uh, those are um, 
grants for students to apply to get funding uh, for a research project. It can be your research that you're working on, a project you want to work on uh, and haven't started yet. It can be part of a thesis and it can also be, you know, a faculty member's research that you want to assist on. So those are, those are due next week. Um, the Eureka registration is due March 11th. And hopefully one of the things that you've gotten from this is that like, just, you know, go for it. Um, I, I think that you, you will, you will get a lot more out of going for it than, uh, than not. Uh, Pursuit, which is our undergraduate research journal. So certainly I think it's awesome when students take their, um, their work and try to publish in journals you know, in their field, but we do have an undergraduate research journal, Pursuit, and if you go to that site there, um, you will see how to submit a manuscript. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the last two, so I mentioned we have, we have you know, both students on here are our, our current semi-finalists to spend a year doing research abroad after graduation uh, through the Fulbright program. And we will do a big information Q and A session. Um, uh, our office will will do that along with uh, Fulbright staff in New York, you know, using Zoom, um, uh, to you know let you know all about the program and how you can teach, do a graduate degree or research abroad for a year on um, paid for by the government, and um, those students who have research experience uh, are, are like a step or seven ahead in terms of their competitiveness um, for the Fulbright. So, um, and whether you are a first or second year student or third or fourth year student, uh, now's a great time just to kind of come and, and learn about, about the program. It's not something you need to put off learning about until, until you're ready. And then um, just, uh, yeah, one last plug on uh, Dr. Stormer's um, research poster, um, talk as part of the undergraduate research uh, weekly seminar series. Uh, and there's a variety of topics throughout the semester. And I, I know some of you have already been to some of those. I think next week there's one on survey research, uh, but there are all sorts of cool topics throughout. Um, and we will send this presentation to you um, uh, af afterwards. So you'll have all of these links. So, um, but, I want to like big thank you to Dr. Stormer, to Samantha Manis, to Catherine Copeland for um, for being fabulous people, and for um, yeah for sharing some of your ideas about a, a process that I think sometimes we just kind of keep to ourselves. And I think it's good just to kind of get this stuff out there and know that oh we all have you know some of the same kinds of questions. Um, and if anyone has any questions from the group or if any of the uh, presenters have, uh, want to say anything um, before we uh, hit end, but I just want to say thank you. Glad all of you could, could be here and, and yeah, I appreciate it.